Yes, we Good afternoon, everyone. Welcome to this webinar by the Wildlife Trusts. We're just going to be waiting a few minutes whilst we let people in. We're all crowding in through the door. So just if you just give us a couple of minutes, we'll have you all in as soon as we can. Got a good number coming through today. I know we've got people from all around the country. Wow, we've got uh, somebody from Somerset there. Hi, Louise. Good to see you. Somebody from Dorset. Hi, Philip. Got people from Derbyshire coming on. We'll just give people uh, a few more minutes. Somebody from Thames Valley, Lancashire. Good to see we've got people from uh, across the country today. Hi, Elizabeth from Buxton. <clears throat> Hi to the children from Buxton Junior School. Good to see you today. Hi, Jane from Chester. Some local people coming on. It's nice to see. Hi, Harriet from Southampton. You're the furthest away, I think, so far. South End. Great to see you all. Just give it a couple more minutes to get everybody in. Somebody from Norwich coming on there. Hi, Vicky. Maybe, maybe not. Are you upset? Vicky's from Suffolk. Got people coming in too fast to tell where they're all coming from. Hi to Louise from Peak District. Give it another minute or so to get people on. Some people are saying they've got a, a, a problem with the, if you've got a problem with your screen, you maybe need to, to log in and try again. Okay, I think that's uh, I think that's probably as many as we're going to get. So let's um, get the show on the road. Hi everyone, good afternoon. My name is Martin Valley. I work with Cheshire Wildlife Trust, um, and I know we've got people from Wildlife Trust around the country. So this is a, a joint venture for all the Wildlife Trust. It's uh, good to see you all, and you're all welcome to this this webinar today. Today we're going to be looking at, um, at moths, marvellous moths, finding things out about moths. And with me I've got Adam Linnett, who is our Wild Communities Officer here at Cheshire Wildlife Trust. Hi Adam. You alright? How are you doing guys? So just to let, let you know what, what to expect this afternoon, uh, we're going to have a little chat with Adam in a minute to get some background to moths. Then we've got a few videos and some tips about how you can see moths in your own back garden. Something you can do yourself, it's not too difficult. Uh, um, and then we've got a chance for questions and answers, and then we've got a bit of a quiz at the end. So, for those of you who, who've maybe not been to one of these before or not familiar with Zoom, um, don't worry, we can't see you, so you can be sitting there in your pajamas, and that's absolutely fine. Um, a little bit of navigation around the screen. You, some of you have found the questions and answers, or some of you have put in your, your comments on there. Um, 
as you as we go along, there will be a time to answer your questions. So if you do have any questions, just pop them in, into the box there with the Q and A. Um, keep coming on the chat. We'll try and have a look at some of those as well. So to make this as interactive as possible so you can get as much out of this as possible and we are recording this so if at the end you've missed something or you want to have a look at how to do some of these um, moth trapping things then we will send you a link through and you can you can go to that and have a look how to do it so um, without any further ado we'll 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 get started then Adam so so Adam um, what do you what's your favorite then are you a butterflies man or a moths man um I'm going to have to say moths. It's a moth webinar, isn't it? Um, yeah, so just the diversity, the numbers, the different colours, the different sizes and shapes, I think moths are probably better than butterflies. Moths, but they're not very colourful. I mean, when, when are you ever going to see like a purple moth, purple and orange moth? Would you ever see one of those? So we do get moths of all colours. For example, the one that's just over your shoulder there, Martin. I mean, there's a moth in my room. It's just over your shoulder. I'm in my house. Why is there going to be a moth? Oh my goodness me, that's a giant moth in my room. How did that get in here? And it's, it's purple and orange as well. You've really got to be careful what you have these days, haven't you? Yeah, you're right. They, 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 they can be very colourful, can't they? So I, 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 and I think people, we, we hear a lot of people talking about butterflies. We don't hear so many people talking about moths. Why, why do you think that is? I think it's because most people are outside in the day. And that's when you see uh, butterflies. And not many people are out there at night, and therefore they don't see that many moths. And a lot of the moths they do see, they don't know the names of. There's quite a lot. They're quite similar. Um, so I just don't think people quite understand moths properly. And we've got a lot more moths than we have butterflies as well, haven't we? So that's, that's, that's part of the problem, isn't it? There's so many of them. Yeah, yeah. All right then, Adam. We're all we're all we're all uh, fired up. Right. So maybe just tell us tell us a bit more about the moth. Then you got a bit of a presentation there to give us. A bit yeah. Of so hopefully you can now we'll see my presentation. Um, so today we're going to look at what moths are, um, what they do, why they're great, and how you can attract them to your garden. Um, there's some things there that I think you should be doing every day. Um, so look after all wildlife, get outdoors, and just be your awesome selves. So, so using the chat, um, give me some words that you think people might use to describe moths. So that might be what they look like, where they live, when they come out, what they eat, what kind of things you think people would think when you mention moths to them. Okay, so nocturnal, brown, furry, hairy, the clothes, um, fluffy, creepy. Yes, yeah, so I think that's mostly what most people think of when you mention moths to them. Um, now let's do the same for butterflies. So if you mention butterflies to people, what kind of words do you think people would associate with butterflies rather than moths? So straight away, lovely, pretty, bright, colourful, um, beautiful, gorgeous, delicate, patterned. So yeah, I think those are the two um, kind of word associations that people would have with moths compared to butterflies. Okay, so if we go back to moths then. So we tend to think, most people would think of these sorts of things when we mention moths. So the small, the brown, the grey, um, they're probably not as colourful and beautiful as butterflies. But I think, actually, if you look at these two moths, look at the patterns on them, they're quite intricate. And I think it's a great example of how once we look closer at wildlife, we look closer at nature, we can see that, that beauty that's actually right in front of our faces if we only pay enough attention to it. Um, so what most people probably don't think of when you say moths is species like this. So you've got uh, elephant hawk moth over there on the left. And that's about two inches across, bright pink, patches of green and yellow on it. And then we've got on the right hand side, a poplar hawk moth. Um, so slightly bigger. And to me, that wing shape looks a little bit like a fire jet. Um, so I think if most people saw things like this, they would probably think that these were butterflies and not moths. Now, that makes it quite difficult then to think about how we separate moths and butterflies. We think 
But flies are big and colourful and pretty. Well, here are moths that look exactly like that. So how do we tell them apart? Now, the truth is, there's no real hard and fast rule. Um, you think the moths have been nocturnal, but we actually have more day flying moths in the UK than we have species of butterfly. So if you're out in the fields and you see something fluttering along, chances are it's probably a moth, not a butterfly. Um, one of the best ways to tell is the antennae. So if you look closely at those pictures, hopefully you can see the, the, the antennae are feathered. So they kind of have a main stem, and then off that come lots of little strands, a bit like a fern. Um, and moths tend to have feathered antennae, and butterflies have clubbed antennae, where it's a single stem with like a little ball on the end, how you, you draw them as a kid. Um, now, some moths actually have clubbed antennae. So there are exceptions to all of these rules that make separating moths and butterflies fairly difficult. So we talked about, a lot about the way that moths look. Now, the reason they look that way is to camouflage themselves. So on the left there, we have a dusky thorn. So that's out probably uh, August, September time, just as those oak leaves are beginning to change colour. And you can see how hard it would be. If you're a predator, you flew past that moth, you would think that that is just an oak leaf and you wouldn't go and eat it. On the right hand side, there's actually two moths in that picture, in amongst the, uh, the twigs. And these are buff tips and they're perfectly camouflaged. So again, passing predators can't see them. Um, so have a look and see if you can think you know where they are. And then when I click, a couple of arrows will come up and show you, see if you're right. So there's those two there. Like I say, brilliant camouflage. Now, the predators they're trying to hide from, in the daytime, it's things like robins, song thrushes, other birds, that a moth is a really tasty meal for. So you need to hide in amongst your surroundings. Now, even that big pink um, elephant hawk moth, it's on the wing this time of year. One of its main food plants is rose bay willow herb, and it's got bright pink flowers on it. So even in amongst those flowers, that bright pink moth is actually quite well camouflaged. Um, so they hide in the day, and most moths will come out at night, at which, at which point it'll be the bats that are their main predators. Now, bats use something called echolocation to find their prey. They, they emit a really high-pitched sound, and the closer they get to something, it'll ping back off the object, and they can build up like a 3D picture of the world around them, even in total darkness. Um, so as they get closer to that moth, they'll call quicker and quicker um, so until they pinpoint it and they grab it in their mouths and have a tasty snack. Now, some moths are fighting back against this. Um, they can actually hear those high-pitched sounds. And as the, the, moth is, the bat's flying closer and closer to the moth, the moth will drop out of the sky when it hears the, the bat come in. It'll wait for the bat to pass and then it'll fly again. And then, in a, a kind of an arms race going on between bats and moths, some moths have learned about this. And what they're doing is they're getting closer to that moth they're actually making their calls quieter and quieter. So there's less chance of the moth hearing them and they can kind of sneak up on it and still get that tasty meal. So even when you're in bed, tucked up at night, there's this um, evolutionary arm trace going on right above our heads. And to me, that is what makes wildlife so fascinating that these things are going on all the time, right around us. Um, so why care about moths? Um, I think moths are great because they're fantastic pollinators. So we hear about how bees pollinate a lot of our food and how good butterflies are for wildflowers and things like that. Actually, moths are one of the best pollinators. They travel further afield. They travel to a wider variety of species of flower. And therefore, they are, they are key in making sure that we look after our meadows and other wild spaces. So if we help to look after the moths, we help to look after these fantastic habitats as well. So hopefully you can see there on the picture of the butterfly, the little club antennae I was talking about. That nice straight stem with a little ball on the end, and that's the kind of antennae most butterflies have. Okay, so we mentioned nocturnal. Somebody said moths are attracted to light, and they are. Now the truth is, we don't really know why they're attracted to light, but we have a theory. And the theory goes that they use the moon to navigate. And that's a quite a complicated phrase. It's known as transverse orientation. And that is where you keep that set angle. So that little blue, blue arrow there, you keep that set angle against the moon. And if that angle remains the same, then they're flying in a straight line. You can imagine if it turns to the left, that angle gets narrower. If it turns to the right, that angle gets wider. And it's thought that that's how moths would usually navigate. 
But what we've done is come around and, and put lights everywhere, street lights, car lights, um, security lights in our gardens. And what the moths do is confuse that for the moon, try to go through this process of keeping that angle the same. But as they move forwards, obviously they very quickly have to change that angle. So to maintain that angle, they end up flying in a circle around the light. So if you ever run a moth trap, you'll notice most moths tend to circle the way into the moth trap as they're trying to maintain that angle. Moth, uh, moth traps as well, they're really bright lights, brilliant for attracting people that are, are interested in moths. So I think that's enough about what moths are, what they do, and why they're fantastic. I think it's now important we think about what we can all do to look after moths in our garden. Um, so one idea is you can plant up some troughs, some planters, some flower beds, um, and provide moths with that um, nectar source throughout the year. So you're looking from kind of April up until September, October. Now, a lot of places when they recommend wildflower species, they suggest things that flower late into the summer, um, but we really need that early nectar source to help those species that emerge early on in the year. Another thing you could do is look at creating a wildflower patch in your lawn. Now it's really simple, you just put the lawnmower away and let the wildflowers grow. You can buy some seed mixes, but just make sure they're packed full of native species that are really good for our native wildlife. So here we've got a list of some species you might want to plant in your garden. As Martin says, you will get a video of this so you don't have to scribble them all down really quickly. Um, but hopefully with things like comfrey, really early emerging plant, right up to ivy that's there late in the year, you'll be able to provide that buffet of nectar fill moths right through their life cycle. Okay, so again, using the chat, now you know a little bit more about moths, um, what kind of words would you use to describe them now? So quite cute, yeah, they are quite fluffy, quite interesting, smart, amazing, sophisticated. Okay, so that to me looks like I've done my job fairly well, and inspires you all about how brilliant moths are. Okay, so there's a few things there um, for what you can do today. So hopefully from that list of species, you can plant some you want to plant in your garden. Um, we'll show you some videos on how you can look for moths in your garden as well. And remember, it's important to always be your awesome self. Okay, I'm gonna hand back to Martin. Thanks. Thanks very much, Adam. I've just been looking at the, um, the questions and answers we've got coming through. And, uh, and there was one that I thought maybe it was now is the good time to answer that question when you were looking at the sort of the, the life cycle and the, and the things about caterpillars. We've got a question here from, from uh, I think this is from a, a, a primary school. It's, and it's, do caterpillars turn into moths in the same way as butterflies do? Do they have the same life cycle? Are they, are they, are they a bit like a butterfly or are they... Do they yeah, so... No, so it'll be fairly similar. The adults will lay eggs, they'll hatch into caterpillars, they'll feed up and they'll pupate, turn to a, a chrysalis or a cocoon, um, and then they'll emerge as an adult the following year normally. A couple of species will have um, several generations a year, um, but a lot will have uh, the lower winter as a caterpillar or as an egg or as a chrysalis and emerge as a, an adult the following year. Okay, so we'll have a look at some more of those questions uh, later on and keep them coming. We've got quite a few, so I don't know whether we'll get through them all. Um, now we want to just show you a quick bit of video so you can see some of the things that Adam's been saying to you sort of in, in the flesh, as it were. We've got um, this first video is from Terry and Carl, who work at um, Chomley, Chomley Castle, which is uh, in Cheshire. They've got some great gardens there, which are great for seeing moths. So I am going to see... today at the top end of Lavinia Walk setting up this moth trap. Now this isn't as bad as it sounds, it's a humane moth trap. What we're going to do is turn this on overnight. I've got a timer here so we'll set that to come on at dusk and then it will go off at dawn and then we'll come in in the morning and there will be lots of moths inside here if you want to come and have a look. So there's lots of egg boxes in there so the moths are attracted to the light and then they fly in, they get caught in here, and then they hide in the egg boxes overnight until we come and let them loose in the morning and see what we've got. 
Okay, so the reason that we're putting this uh, light source trap up here for the moths at the top end of the vineyard walk and next to the glade is because we've got lots of really gorgeous, as you can see behind me, next to rich plants at the moment. And they're also quite heavily scented, especially if you're an insect. Now these are attracting the moths to this area in particular without any help from the trap. So we're hoping that this will be a really great place to situate this and we'll get lots of different species this evening. Here's an image of one of the egg boxes from the trap. As you can see, we caught quite a lot of moths. The first of which was a buff tip. These are excellently camouflaged to look like sticks. This protects them from the predation of birds. This is a white ermine. A beautiful garden tiger. And these are peppered moths. They're a good example of natural selection at work with the darker colouring becoming more prominent during the sooty industrial revolution when the trees became darker and therefore they were less camouflaged. Now the air's cleaned up, they've returned to their more natural paler colour which matches with the lichens that they rest against. This is a light emerald. A lesser swallow prominent. Dark pine knot horn. A clay triple lines, the shiny burnished brass, one of my favourites, a buff ermine, and here is a buff arches moth. And this is the largest moth that we found, and it's a poplar hawk moth. A green oak tortrix. This is a ghost moth. A beautiful golden wine, a peach blossom, a brimstone moth, a red barred tortrix, and a colourful and charismatic elephant hawk moth. They're named as such, elephant hawk moth, because their caterpillar is well known for looking like an elephant's trunk. As well as using light source traps, there are other ways that you can attract moths to your garden so that you can see them. You can also make wine ropes. You'll need quite a lot of sugar and a bottle of cheap red wine. Start by pouring the sugar and the wine into a saucepan and heat gently so it doesn't burn and keep stirring it. This will eventually dissolve the sugar into the wine and make a really sticky syrup. Once that syrup's cooled, you can either decant it into a box or keep it in the pan. You'll need to find an old rag, not nothing nice, and cut this into strips. Once you've cut this into strips, place it into the mixture and give it a good stir until all the rag has soaked up the juice. Okay, so we've left these to sit for a couple of hours just to soak up all the sugar and uh, the wine mix that's in there. So what I'm going to do now is literally hang them over this elder, which might be easier said than done. I'm just going to put that on the floor while I do it. Okay, these are really sticky, so I'm just using these tweezers. Definitely a sticky finger job. And hopefully we should get some moths coming to these to eat the sugar. I have a feeling we might also get some other insects as well. Well, there we go. Oh, is that a bit? No, we're fine there. Um, I'm going to space these around and we can come back later and see what we've got. Okay, so I hope you could see from that video not only what the fascinating range of moths, but also how easy it is to see them. So, so Adam, is this something that anybody can just go out and look at, or do we need to be experts of moth trapping, do you think? Yeah, so I always think we often have a, a thing where we think we need to know the name of everything, and we don't really need to know that. And um, what's important is you go out and you discover things, and maybe you learn the name, maybe you don't. Um, but as long as it inspires you and you like seeing them, then anyone can go in and look for moths. 
And they have got some amazing names, haven't they? So do you think people sit in rooms and think of what's the craziest name we can call a moth? I mean, they're amazing, aren't they? Yeah, so a lot of moths are named after the, how they look. Um, so like the, the clay treble lines um, that was in that video has three lines across it. Um, and some of them have names because they look um, like a lot of other moths. So there's things like an uncertain or a suspect. Um, so it just kind of gives you an idea that they might look very similar um, to other species. So is there a little brown moth? Oh, is there a little brown moth? Um, I don't think there is, but I think you could. The, the competition for that name in the moth world would be fairly high. Um, so I don't think they went with just a little brown moth. Or a slightly smaller moth. They we were thinking that scientists were really clever coming up with these names where you just have to look and see the thing that you can see most obviously, don't you? Right. Yeah, it's like that phrase, say what you see. Say what you see. And they're amazing colours as well, aren't they? The colours that they have. Why, do, why, why are they so colourful? Um, so a lot of them, like I say, is to camouflage them. So they'll kind of be broken up with, with different shapes. Um, some of them, I'd imagine it's, it's similar to bird plumage in that they want to attract a mate. So the brighter they look, the healthier they are, the more likely they are to, to find a mate. Right, okay. So, it's, so we, can eat, we can all easily go and see if we can find some moths for ourselves. And now we've got a little video where we're going to show you that. Emma, one of our team here at Cheshire Wild, I trusted this in her back garden of an ordinary house. So it's something that maybe we can all try at home. So I'm just going to put this video on and um, you can see what, how she gets on. Hi, my name's Emma and tonight I'm going to spend the evening in my garden looking at what moths are visiting. All I'll need is a white sheet and a torch. Now I'm going to use a lamp off of a moth trap just to make filming a bit easier. If you decide to use a lamp as well, it's worth keeping in mind that moths aren't really attracted to LEDs which are quite common in household lamps, so just keep that in mind. Let's get set up. Okay, we've got our sheet set up and our light's nice and bright now. What I have brought over is a couple of plants. This is a nicotine plant and behind me is a jasmine. Now these are both night scented flowers and moths are really attracted to them. So hopefully that helps encourage a few more visitors. We've just got to wait for it to get dark now. While you're waiting for it to get dark, it's a really good time to have a nighttime explore around your garden. Have a good look in your flower beds. You might find a lot of different bugs to what you usually see in the daytime. Keep an ear out for owls, keep an eye out for bats, and if you're lucky, you might even have a visiting hedgehog. Now it did take a little while for the moths to arrive, so if you are using a torch, it might be worth hanging it up on the sheet just so you don't get a tired arm. But as you can see, once they did start arriving, we had quite a few and they were all really excited by the light. We had quite a number of species around the light. It's quite useful to have an identification book handy, just so you can see the species of moths. This was an elephant hawk moth that arrived right at the end. And as it got much later, they all started calming down and landing on the sheet. So it gave me a really good opportunity to take some pictures. So that's, um, that's great there. So Adam, they seem, some of those moths in that film seem pretty small. Um, what's the kind of size range we've got for moths? Have we got big ones or are they, or they're all tiny like those? Yeah, so they are quite a, a a different size range. So you'll get micro moths that are really tiny, like less than a centimetre in length, um, right along to things like um, some of the bigger hawk moths. So if you're further south in the country, um, privet hawk moths that are probably somewhere between three and four inches in um, wingspan, so a, you know a sizable moth. And how are they doing in England? Are they, are they in trouble? Are we, do we need to, to, to protect them in any way? So similar to a lot of insects, moths are um, declining in general. Um, and that's due to the way that, you know, we manage the landscape um, and the way that we look after gardens as well. Um, so I'm sure what most people have seen is people tidying, tidying up um, their gardens, removing hedgerows and putting in fence panels, 
which you know removes the food plant for caterpillars as well as nectar for the adults and getting rid of lawns and replacing them with patios and plastic lawns um, which again a lot of moths will feed their caterpillars on different grasses and things like that um, so hopefully if people look after their gardens we can start to see um, those declines hopefully reversing and moth population starting to build so although sometimes we think there's nothing we can do to, to stop the decline in these insects, actually, if we just look at our gardens and do something with our gardens, we can make a contribution, can't we? Yeah, so I think um, nationally, gardens take up more space than all the nature reserves combined. So if we all looked after our gardens in a wildlife friendly way, we'd make a huge impact um, for the wildlife of the UK. Okay, easy thing to do. Right, so now we've got a little bit of time for some questions. And I know we had, um, we had a, a picture sent in by somebody just before, and I'm going to see if I can find that picture. Not that one. I'm going to see whether we can find the picture, and maybe you can identify this moth for us, Adam. So here it is. Right, let's just show you that. Try that again. Just show you that. We'll just show you that picture on the. Can you see that on there, Adam? On the right hand side. Yes, so I think, just let me check. I think that is a nut tree tussock. Um, four, four. So this is my handy ID guide. We'll have a look at it in a minute because um, a couple of people have asked about decent ID guides. Oh, maybe it's not. I thought it was a nut tree tussock, first look. Mm, might have to go through the ID guide and try and find similar species. Um, what well, that would have been my guess, not tree tussock. Not tree tussock. So let's show us your guide then, Adam, while I look for some questions. So somebody asked about the best guides to um, look up the moths that you find. Now this, this is my really well-worn, um, really used copy of this. So this is the concise guide to the moths of Great Britain, Britain and Ireland. Um, now, I quite like this version, the spiral bound version, because it sits flat. So when you're looking at your moths, you can put your book down and you don't lose your page. Um, other moth guides are available, um, but to me, that's probably the best one. And I think it was just last year, a micro moth uh, ID book came out. Um, so you can see some of the patterns of the, the ID book, um, of the, the micro moths in this book. Um, again, another really good one, but micros tend to be, you know, fairly similar to tell them apart. It's quite tricky. Yes. Um, alongside them, I'd also suggest you get yourself a little mothing um, field journal. So you can write down what moths you've seen, tally them up, and keep track of what moths you've seen and where you've seen them. So when did, Adam, when did you get into moths then? What, how old were you when you... When you... Oh, um, many moons ago. Um, probably about 10 years ago, so I would have been mm, 23. Right, what, um, what, what, was, what was your inspiration? Why did, you, why did you think these moths, I'm going to find out more? So I started volunteering at my local nature reserve, and they ran a moth trap on a regular basis. And it was just kind of, you know, learn a little bit about the moths there, learn some ID skills, and hopefully it'll help you get a job in the future, and learn a little bit more about these creatures and how to look after them. And here we are now. So that's it. There's a top tip there for any budding naturalists. Have a look at your local wildlife trust, wherever you're from, there'll be a wildlife trust that may be running something like that. So let's have a look at some of these questions. We've got we've got a hundred questions, Adam. So I'm not sure ah. we're not sure we're gonna get through them all in the next in the next five or ten minutes. So we will if there if there's any questions we can answer, we will try and answer them afterwards if we if we've got time. But we've got one here from um he's asked from Rochelle, her name's Rochelle, and she's asked how long do, do moths live for? So that will vary on the, the different species. Um, as an adult moth, some species will actually live for a, a considerable amount of time. Um, so thinking of things maybe like December moths, which as the name suggests around December, um, because they don't need to feed um, and because they're not exerting huge amounts of energy, they actually tend to live a, a fairly long life. Um, so it, it depends on the species really. So we've had quite a few people who are asking how many moths there are. Do you know how many moths there are in England? I not off the top of my head, but you answered this for me. Yeah, the other day. I thought I would I'd let the expert answer, but I actually think it's about two and a half thousand moths is what 
is what I, I, I read the other day, which, which is a lot, isn't it? It's quick if you're going to remember what they're all called. Yeah, so just to give people a, a bit of an idea of how many mossing could expect to find in their garden, I actually grew up in Staffordshire, in Stoke-on-Trent, in a fairly urban garden, right behind McDonald's. So competing against the glowing ends of a McDonald's, my moth trap, um, and we recorded well over 100 species in, in the garden. Um, so there's plenty out there, like you say, 2,500 um, species in the country. And actually, you can get well over 100 in, in a fairly small space. Yeah. Okay, we've had another question here which says uh, from Beth, why do moths sit with their wings open rather than how but butterflies sit with their wings closed? So I think, again, that's slightly more to do with their camouflage. So they sit flat against a, a tree or, you know, something that they're sat on so they don't stand out. Whereas a buckfly will sit with its wings up, upright like that behind its back because if a predator sees it and comes towards it, it can actually fly away fairly quickly. Um, whereas a, a moth kind of um, method is to hide um, rather than, than to run. Right. I've got a great question here from Kate Lemon. She says, where do moths go over winter? So again, it'll depend on the species. So some will overwinter as an egg, some overwinter as a caterpillar, um, some will pupate. So the elephant haunt moth, for example, that will actually pupate underground and it'll emerge um, as an adult then this time of year, the following year. Um, some like the December moth, winter moth, November moth, the name suggests they are adults through the winter months and then normally as an egg um, around into the next year. So it depends on the species. It depends on the species. I suppose with two and a half thousand, they're not all going to do the same thing, are they? This is part yeah. of it. So we've got um, Ruth. Ruth has asked, um, can you tell the difference between a butterfly and a moth by looking at their caterpillar? Um, so not really, as far as I'm aware. Um, we get sent quite a few pictures of caterpillars, tridi, um, and the majority of them tend to be moths. Um, but I don't think there's any way of telling them apart purely by the caterpillars, unless you ID it to a species level and then you know what it is. Or unless you, unless you wait until it uh, turns into either a moth or, or a butterfly, but maybe that's a, that's a, a, long, a long time to wait yeah. to find out. Um, so there's, there's quite a few people asking how we get them out of our house. Um, how do, how do, what's the best way to get moths out of your house? A pint glass and a, an old letter, it tends to be the best way. Um, like I say, they, they can't, um, navigate like we would, or a bird where they'd see an open window and they might fly out of it, and a bit of a helping hand, and um, so just catching hold of it in a pint pot and, and letting it go uh, is probably the best way. So do they really eat all of our clothes, Adam, or is that just a myth? So, some, um, a couple of species of moth do, uh, and they're known as clothes moths, and they tend to feed on uh, natural fibres like wool. So what we've actually seen in the last 20, 30 years is the population of those moths declining as we all move to synthetic fabrics in things like fleeces and, uh, and other items of clothing. Um, they are starting to make a little bit of a comeback as people start buying more natural materials. Um, so yeah, they, they do eat clothes sometimes, um, but like I say, the population's actually declined quite a bit in the last couple of decades. Yeah. Another, I've got, we've got a question here from Lorna, and, and she's, she's asking about if we do um, see and identify moths, where should we submit any recordings? What should we do about the recordings? So this will vary depending where you are in the, the country. Um, so I only really know about Staffordshire and Cheshire because I'm from Staffordshire and I, I work in Cheshire. Um, so for Cheshire, there is a local record centre and called Record, and you could submit your sightings to them. Um, Every other county will be slightly different, but there will be a county moth recorder, which is like the moth expert in your county, and you can submit your records to them. All right, I suppose you could always ask your local wildlife trust if you're not sure, couldn't you? And certainly, yeah. uh, butterfly con conservation are, are trying to track and monitor moths. So I think if you do identify a moth, it's always good to, to share that information with people who are interested in, in knowing. So this is one for you, Adam. What's your, what's your favourite moth? Quite a few people have been asking you, what is your favourite moth? Um, so my favourite moth, um, I might try and find it in the book as I talk. Um, so my favourite moth is known as a Merve du jour, um, which for those of you who speak French um, will know that that means marvel of the day. Um, let me try and find it. Um, and it is the most gorgeous little green, <clears throat> it's like a mint green, 
um, colour um, out into the autumn, it's on the wing, and just the colours on it are really, really nice. Um, like I say, it's not, not big, it's not showy, but just the intricate patterns on it are really, really beautiful. Is that quite common? Have you seen that quite often, or is it quite rare to see one of those? Um, they're not terribly common. I think they're associated with mature oak woodland, um, so you have to kind of run a trap somewhere in a woodland rather than in your garden. But yeah, not, not terribly common. Okay, we've just got time for a couple more. Um, what would you say is the best plant to grow in your garden for moths to, to feed off? What's the best thing we can do? So one of the best things is something like buddleia. So huge nectar source really late on in the year. And it's great to kind of go out with a torch. You can actually just look at the flowers and you'll see moths um, nectaring on that, on buddleia. Um, but really, like I said, it's the um, it's providing that nectar source right from the start of the year all the way through. Um, but moth numbers tend to peak around about July. So anything that's in flower in July, you've got a good chance of helping quite a lot of moths in Mongo. And then, and then uh, Mike here asked, why are they furry? Do you know why they're furry, Adam? What's the fur for? I aren't 100%, but I'd imagine it's probably fairly similar to, um, to things like bees and, and butterflies. Um, they're pollinators, so the pollen tends to stick to their fur. And as they go from plant to plant, they're spreading that pollen around and helping to make sure they've got a food source going into the future. All right, we'll have, we'll have one last question, and uh, it's, quite, it's quite topical. It's, uh, Liz asks, uh, will different species come to the UK from abroad with changing temperatures? Yes, so they will. Um, so we're seeing um, species such as the box moth coming over from the continent. Last year was quite an influx year, and we started to get our first record in some counties of box moths. Um, now, if you're a gardener and you like your box hedges, um, box moths, you do not want any of them. Um, their, their caterpillars will um, take all the leaves off, off your box hedges. Um, so that's something that a lot of conservationists are kind of monitoring closely, so we can keep a track on them um, and make sure they're not going to do too much damage to, to people's gardens. So it's going to be it's a bit of a dynamic situation then, where new new species are going to come in and old ones are going to go out, aren't they? I guess. Yeah. So we will start to lose things out the top end of the country, if that makes sense. As we start, as things get warmer and it actually needs a cooler climate, it'll push it further and further up the country. Um, so we we will probably start to see things like that happen as well. Okay. Great, Adam. Thanks for that. Pretty good answers to a lot of those questions. Uh, sorry for those of you who didn't get your question answered, but we had we had quite a few today, so that's encouraging. But unfortunately, that doesn't mean we've been able to answer them all. So we're just going to finish off now. We've got a few more minutes at the end, and we're just going to finish off with a little quiz. We like to do a little quiz just to see. Um, it's always fun to do a quiz, and also to see to what extent you've been able to remember some of the things that I've said, and what, you know whether you've learned some new stuff. So I'm going to, you'll see it on the screen. Uh, you'll see a, little, a box coming up with the quiz on, and all you've got to do is to just um, click on the answer that you think is right. So I'm going to launch the first question right now. You should see it on your screen. And the question is, most moths come out at night. Is that true or false? A little bit of uh, conflict there, I'm sure. We've got... Um, Just let a few more of you answer. Most moths come out at night. Um, and we have got a little bit of difference at the moment. So we'll just end that one and you'll let you see the answer, share the result. You can see that. You see, that's interesting there. A lot of people are still thinking that more moths come out in the day. Would you? What would you say to that question? Would you say that's... Uh... So most moths come out at night, but I think where people have got confused there is that more moths than butterflies are out in the day. But uh, most moths come out at night. So, so most moths come out in the day. Tricky. But, but more moths come out in the day than butterflies come out in the day. Yeah. Okay. So let's try another one. And look. Next question. Moths are all brown, dull and boring. You're all getting that. You're all getting this one right. You've you've managed to convince you've managed to convince most people here, Adam. Just give good a few more seconds to come through with that one. Okay, looks like we're all going to get. So we'll share the results of that. So nearly everybody thinks that moths are not all brown, dull, and boring. So that's that's a good thing. Okay, well, got another question up.
So which of the following is a moth? Is it a red admiral, a skipper, a peacock, or a dusky fawn? So this is a tricky question about moth's na moth names. So we have mentioned it during my presentation. If you're paying attention, you should know what it is. A little bit more tricky, this one. Some of these names of moths make them make you think they these may well be names of moths, but we'll finish that one there. Share the results. Most of you have managed to get that one right. So excellent. Dusky moth, dusky thorn is is the only one that's a moth. The others are are butterflies. Is that right, Adam? Yeah. Well, skippers are a family of butterflies, but yeah. Okay. Go on to the next question. Moths can sometimes be named after how they look. So what feature has an eye-hawked moth? What feature does an eye-hawked moth have? Does it have spots, stripes, or an eye? Remember that we, what we said about the naming of it, whatever, whatever you see, call it that. Okay, we'll end that poll there and we'll share the results, see how you got on. So, hold on, hold on, I'll just, I'll, I'll get, get the screen out of the way so you can see Adam. Okay. So you can see there, looks like it's got eyes on it. So if you're a predator again, you see that, it actually looks bigger and it looks like a bigger creature than it is due to, due to those huge eyes that it has on its wings. So that's the, the idea of that is they scare people away, is it? Into, making them think and does it do you see when you were saying it actually looks like an eye it's not a spot it's more like a sort of iris shape is it yeah so it's got like a an iris and a pupil in it so it looks more like an eye than a spot okay Good one. right so then question number five moths are attracted to light is it because they need the light's heat to keep them warm is it because they are attracted to circular objects or is it because they use it to navigate now Adam did mention this again in his in his presentation so if you were listening you should be able to get this one right okay we'll stop that one there most of you are getting this one correct share the results and see how you did so the answer is they use it to navigate remember Adam was talking about how they use the moon so what are, what, are, what are day flying moths used to navigate then, Adam? I imagine they just, because they can um, use the light and they can see what's around in the day, they will just fly around as they, they see fit. Right. Okay, just a couple more questions. Question number six, we we'll launch this one. Along with their antenna, what body parts do moths use to smell? Did you, did you talk about this, Adam, in your talk? No, I didn't. So, well, people, have, people know we'll the answer. See who knows about moths already. People already, they, they, they've already learned. Just by listening to you, they learned this. Most people are getting this one right. Just give a couple more seconds, and then we'll let you see the answer to that one. Share the results. So the answer is feet. Which is weird, how many of us smell through our feet? But uh, animals are great, aren't they? Yeah, so they've got little receptors on their feet that allow them to kind of tell what plant they're on. Um, so they know if they're gonna lay their, their eggs on a plant that their caterpillars will eat or not. Okay, uh, let's launch this one. Which of these is not a moth? The ghost? The shark, the old lady, or the rabbit? A bit more of a mixed bag with this one. People aren't necessarily so sure. Okay, a couple more seconds to get those answers through. I'll end that poll there and share the results. Neck and neck with the with the old lady and the rabbit, Adam. 
it so it's a rabbit. There is an old lady moth. Um, and oddly enough, it tends to not come to the light trap, but it is attracted to the wine ropes. Make of that what you will. <laughs> is that why it's called the old lady? So. Okay, and then the last question. Moths, oh wait, I haven't launched it yet. Moths die if you remove the scales from their wings. Is that true or false? Moths die if you remove. True or false? Okay, nearly got all you through there. Sharing that results, pretty even again, but most of you think that's true. Is that, uh, is that, what, we, is that what we think, Adam? Is that right? It's actually false. So they don't die if you remove the scales from the wing. So the patterns are actually made up of tiny little scales that come off on your fingers like a powder. Um, and it was thought that if you remove those scales then that moth would die. Um, it doesn't, it won't die, but obviously you might cause some damage to it as you're doing that. Um, and obviously you're removing its camouflage. So you see quite a few worn moths when you're moth trapping, where all those scales have fallen off. You can't tell what species the moth is, but it is still alive. So they don't die just from removing the scales um, from the wings. Well, there you go. So what, what role do the scales play then in the, for the moth? It's just what gives them their patterning. Right. No, nothing more significant than that. Not that I know of. You know what? Great. Well, thanks very much for that, Adam. It's been great to um, to learn a bit more about moths from, from you and from the videos. Um, that's, that's the end of the webinar today. So thank you, everyone, for, for tuning in. If you do want to listen to it again, as we say, we'll be sending out a link and you can, you can watch it again. If you want to look at some of those videos for how to do some of those trapping things. We hope you get, get outside and find a bit more about moths. And we hope you've enjoyed today and learned a bit more. And we'll see you again soon. All right. Thanks, everyone. Bye.